Thank you, first of all, for the kind invitation. Of course, it's my pleasure to talk to you. When I woke up this morning, it was a bit late, but I didn't care, so I just went ahead and prepared myself. Then I looked at the mirror, my eye was good, so I said to myself, Yeah, I grew up in, in Basel, which is in Switzerland, the hometown of Leonard Euler also, whom I consider the greatest mathematicians of all times. In primary school, I kind of liked mathematics, although what, what you are taught is not really mathematics at the time. I mean, uh, you learn by, you're taught to learn by heart what is seven times eight. Learning by heart is actually quite the contrary of the mathematical way of thinking. But then I quickly uh, started to do the calculus my own way. I did this quite independently. And then I remember uh, once I was puzzled about the question, uh, why is, uh, okay, 11 is 10 plus 1, but 11 times 11 is not 10 times 10 plus 1 plus 1. Thing. And when I walked home, I thought about this question. And when I arrived home, I think I had uh, discovered what was missing. So I think I could discover the binomial formula by myself. Later, I was really fascinated by Euclidean geometry, the old geometry by the Greeks, by Pythagoras, Thales, and so on. Just the way that you don't need to draw very precisely, you don't even compute, but it's just logical thinking about. Also combinatorics I liked a lot, okay. Yes. Then uh, the challenge was kind of um, not so satisfactory, then I started to play chess after I... Uh, at the beginning, I was much interested in soccer, then I, I dropped this at the age of about 12 or so because I noticed it's getting very ambitious and then I started to uh, look for something else. And I got bored of it after a while, but of course you can say it's just a game, it's useless, but uh, nevertheless, I think I learned to concentrate on one thing at a time. When I was done with school, I went to Zurich. I think the English title is Swiss Federal Institute for Technology. German, it has the opportunity. ETH. The first year is actually the same if you study mathematics or physics. So then only after one year you decide in which direction you go and uh, they then prefer to go for physics yeah. with Konrad Osterwalder, who is always famous in physics. Uh, mm -hmm. He actually justified that we can use do calculus and field theory with the Euclidean space or instead of the Minkowski space, which is very uh, convenient lectures, for instance, with Jörg Fröhlich, who is a very famous uh, theoretical physicist, but also mm -hmm. very formal, very mathematical. Walter Baltensberger is a physicist in, who worked in the theory of uh, solid states. I later met him again in Brazil when I was in Brazil. Mm -hmm. uh, we had the quantum mechanics lectures with Professor Hepp, who was also known for the proof of renormalizability of, uh, of quantum electrodynamics. Mm -hmm. And uh, also did the, the diploma thesis with him later. And I remember a famous, uh, he confronted this with a citation of Dirac, which uh, I also tell my students sometimes, uh, okay, apparently Dirac once gave a seminar, you know, he was a guy who was a little communicative. <laughs> mm -hmm. And and then uh, then somebody uh, said, Professor Dirac, I don't understand why in the third line you divide by blah, blah, blah. Dirac, just still no reaction at all. <laughs> After a while, the, the chairman asked Professor Dirac, would you not like to answer this question? And Dirac yeah. just said, this was not a question, this was a statement. <laughs> <laughs> because I said, I don't understand that. Okay, we don't understand that, so what? This is not a question. <laughs> okay, it was also very formal, very mathematical, but I remember he gave us a, a nice article by David Mermin with the title, Is the Moon There When Nobody Looks? It's a famous citation of Einstein who said, okay, it's hard to believe that uh, reality mm -hmm. is not there before you observe it. This is what quantum mechanics uh, tells you. And, uh, and, then, and then he apparently, during the walk in the night, he, he asked somebody, do you really think the moon is not there anymore when nobody looks? In <laughs> <laughs> class show, he gave a bit of messy talk without any preparation, uh, CN Young. He gave a much nicer talk, and uh, also once Hans Bethe showed up, 
Um, he lived until recently, I think he, he got almost 100 years old. And um, mm -hmm. even when he was about 90, he still kept writing papers. Uh, at that time, he spoke about astrophysics. But of course, he did many things. And uh, I noticed recently, I uh, uh, talked a lot about this Oppenheimer movie. And I think it is the only person who I have seen um, in my life who, who appears in this movie. So I, I did my diploma thesis. This is uh, what we call it in Zurich. It is essentially equivalent to a master thesis on something like uh, the, uh, the the motion of the eyes, you know, that you you move mm -hmm. your eyes. You can do this very quickly from one position to the other. So you have your muscles, which pull, and, and, um, and then you do this in a very short time. You have a kind of a jump and slow down again, just at the right position how this is done. And there was a, a model which was quite established at the time is who, who describes, okay, you have two muscles, so you can move left and right your position. But the professor said, well, but actually you have three angles. You can move also look up and down and you have torsion. And that is actually a non-abelian group. There's so three that you are out position half and you have correspondingly six muscles. And uh, mm -hmm. why don't you extend this model to all the, to all the three uh, rotation angles that we have. And then, okay, I simulated this. It was a system of 21 differential equations, non-linear, but you can uh, you can calculate this numerically. It was relatively new that we have computers for doing that. And then mm -hmm. I noticed, okay, if we do all the three angles, the system doesn't work at all anymore. And so this, this famous, yeah. famous model was actually, was actually That's... only appropriate for one angle. So that was, uh, that was my diploma thesis. Uh, at the time, we had text systems, but not to, to write formula was not good. So I still had to fit in the formula by hand. And then uh, I was there for, I think, 12 weeks. And um, uh, we were told that we were doing very important things. Charm first, it stands CERN, Hamburg, Amster, Moscow collaboration. So it has nothing to do with the charm quark. This is, was the, this is how the name was constructed. They measured neutrino scattering and uh, the Weinberg angle. This is an angle which says how how much uh, there is a twist in the electroweak force uh, the, between the electro the electromagnetic and the weak sector. This is a free parameter of the standard model, which was not that precisely known at that time. And uh, with this scattering of neutrinos and matter, one could one could uh, fix it a bit better. And I was in charge of writing a kind of a program which tells you, okay, we had a lot of tracks of this detector when something is wrong, that it gives you a alarm message and then specifies exactly where, where one has to fix which for each problem. And then uh, just getting a little bit into the community. So I was impressed by this atmosphere of a global village that you have people from everywhere. So at that time, okay, it was still called war, but we had Russian collaborators. They collaborated without any problem and also invited each other for dinner and so on. And I already thought, okay, that's actually a model for humanity. Yeah, exactly. A guy called Ted Wilson, who was, uh, for instance, an accelerator specialist, uh, who I just remember that he greeted us. Oh, we are all students who did relatively well in the first years of studies. And so he said, oh, you are the cream of Europe. Uh, John Ellis, who is still around, uh, he gave his usual style of a talk. T.D. Lee showed up. He gave uh, his usual standard talk about parity violation. Already, uh, somebody asked a question. I think some people have to have good. Uh, they think they have good arguments for this and that. And and then uh, <laughs> Lee, uh, it is a bit arrogant style. Well, well, if you think that you can decide physics question with a popular referendum, go ahead. <laughs> Maurice Sacco, I remember very well. Where he was the head of the theory division with his extremely nice and uh, strong French accent. So, so here we have to find the theory which is reasonable <laughs> and then he always messed up his transparency so usually okay yeah, we still have this plastic transparencies and he came out of this and then he was always looking oh i have a good picture for this and then later <laughs> after i did this diploma i was at cern again for for a year working in a lot of collaboration called cp lear uh, this was more about um, observing neutral k on decay it was uh, the it was about the parameters of the CP violation. So if you if you apply parity and at the same time the transformation from matter to or from particles to antiparticles, this is a, a symmetry which for a short time people thought is a symmetry of nature. Then it turned out no, it is broken. One could see it uh, mm -hmm. in the neutral K and decay. Meanwhile, one has also other evidence. And uh, the, the point of the experiment was to parameterize this uh, CP violation a bit better. 
what we still believe is CTT. So if at the same time you invert the direction of time, this is still assumed to be exact. And uh, this was also tested in this experiment, but of course that we could not find a violation. It was a uh, great news for a moment that uh, some guys in Salt Lake City, two chemists, claimed that they could uh, produce a cold fusion, nuclear mm -hmm. fusion with an incredible rate. And of course this can happen, but even in seawater, but with a very low rate. And um, then people really thought now we have unlimited uh, access to, to energy and so on. The energy problem is solved and some newspapers wrote. Uh, so this was the headline of all the newspapers, the greatest discovery since humanity uh, mm -hmm. controls fire and so on. And uh, and this guy, uh, one of these guys called Fleischmann, he was in Europe and then he was invited to, to CERN to give a talk about this. And uh, yeah, this was, this was a funny, okay, Carlos Rubia was the own director, an Italian who was very polemic style. So he first he kicked out all journalists because he said this, this, is, a, this is a scientific seminar and so on. And, uh, and then he, he presented Fleischmann with a kind of an intentional uh, mistake. He said, okay, uh, he is not a scientist. Oh, excuse me. I wanted to say he is not a physicist. He is a chemist. And so on. But, but, well, uh, later actually it turned out that he was uh, some kind of right. Okay, this this is an experiment which is relatively simple to do, and then uh, okay, relatively quick. You don't need an accelerator or anything. And then a lot of uh, groups around the world jumped on this, and within a few weeks or okay. most months, it was completely clear that this is nonsense. The result is wrong. They made a mistake, and then everything went downhill. And I think these two guys have done damage to their reputation for the rest of their lives. Uh, my PhD advisor was Heiri Lloydfield. This is the Swiss. Short form, the uh, formula it's Heinrich. He is a very famous uh, physicist. He was actually one of the founders of QCD together with Gelman and Fritsch. And then together with his Swiss colleague, Jörg Gasser, he was kind of the, they were the people who were developed the uh, chiral perturbation theory. So I'd say, okay, QCD is very complicated unless you are at very high energy, then it simplifies thanks to asymptotic freedom. But at low energy where we really live, uh, it's, it's, it's almost uh, untractable, at least it seems so at the time, but then you can convert it into an effective theory, which just captures the low energy parameters. And this is the, turn this into a very systematic machine called chiral perturbation theory. And in this framework, I also did my PhD thesis and then we had a uh, other professor there, uh, Peter Minkowski. He was related somehow to Hermann Minkowski indirectly, but he was, I was often his assistant, uh, took him, mm -hmm. taking care of the exercises in his lectures. And I also had to listen to his lectures because he didn't follow the plan. He just invented something, but he, he did this very well. One detail that I remember that he told me about is this Bubaki project. Uh, it was a group of French top French mathematicians in the 20th century who wanted to rewrite the whole mathematics from the very beginning, very rigorously. I'd say uh, they built everything from the from the axioms and so on. There was a Bubaki as a name that they invented, Nicolas Bubaki, a person that never existed, but they said this is the name that we, we use as a, as a authorship for the for this series of books. And he told me that the book is so rigorous that uh, they only write page numbers after they have rigorously defined the natural numbers. Sure. So there was a, a German uh, colleague who gave a seminar at some point. He said, okay, we wanted to calculate this complicated and there you need a student. So I had a student who calculated this and he did give a name and even somebody asked, was this a good student? He says, yeah, yeah, it was a good student because he cannot find literature about how to do that. And then he did this and, and so up to the very end of his seminar, he never mentioned the name of the student. And then I just remember for myself, I will never do that. And so, we had a visit there by John Archibald Wheeler. Uh -huh. Okay, he was, I think he he was once an advisor of, of my advisor of Ivy Lloyd Wheeler. But I knew his name more from Gravity. He was one of the authors of the famous Gravity books. He was also, he revit, revitalized general relativity, which uh, for some time, he was not a field of work anymore. It was accepted, but people thought, well, there's not much to do about it. He was one of the persons that, okay, you can do a lot of it. Of it. Yeah. When we were in, in Bern, he visited us. We had in the coffee room a small choke uh, um, at, at, uh, at the door. And he understood a little bit of German, but it was in German, not enough to fully understand the joke. So the joke was kind of... Um, 
uh, it was about a Geiger counter. Yeah? Uh -huh. Geiger, Geiger actually, Geiger is a violin. So Geiger, it is a name, of course, but actually it means violin player. Yeah? Uh -huh. The joke says, do you know that, did you know that it is only uh, worthwhile using a Geiger counter when you deal with a large, large orchestra? So <laughs> because then you need to share. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and I was, I was happy that I could, uh, could help him to explain whatever the joke, whatever, the joke, whatever <laughs> Because nowadays students are sent a lot to conferences and so on all around. Actually, it was only once in Trieste in, in Italy, which was a nice experience. In particular, I let, let Larry Schulman, who was the author of a textbook, maybe the only uh, the, the, I think the only one which was used at the moment. And um, okay, he was very friendly, he talked to me also in the evening and so on. So it was very pleasant to get. Yes. So when I did my PhD, I was for a short time, about two months, that was in, in Moscow, in the Institute of Theoretical and Experimental Physics. What that uh, various people there told me about was about Landau, because he worked there and there was long after before he had his, his bad accident, he was the great authority. On one hand, he could be very friendly, but on the other hand, uh, okay, he could also be a bit, bit polemic. So if he, uh, so okay, if he didn't like anything, so he, he could he expressed it well, quite in a, quite a hard way. So they told me once they had a prominent visitor, I think an Englishman, and they took him to a seminar. The seminars were in Russian and said, mm -hmm. okay, Landau, he speaks a lot of languages. He can sit next to you and translate. And then the mm -hmm. speaker started to speak a little and made a pause to give Landau time to translate. But Landau just kept silent and he thought, oh, well, maybe he wants to translate more at a time. And then he continued a little and made another pause and looked at Landau again. And Landau just told, uh, told the visitor, so far, the speaker hasn't said anything interesting. <laughs> so I was there as a, as a visitor for one and a half years. I started then to move already to the lattice, lattice field theory, uh, not because it was done in Brazil, because that because I was in contact with a, a kind of a new advisor that I, mm -hmm. that I had, uh, with, uh, with, which turned out to be my long-term collaborator who put me onto the subject. And uh, I started to like this a lot. But I also worked on one project with uh, Jose von uh, Giambiacci. He is an uh, Argentinian who then moved to Brazil. And mm -hmm. um, okay, he was together with his colleague Bolini. They, they invented, when they were in La Plata, kind of isolated, they invented the dimensional regularization. So the point is quantum field theory, if you want to compute things straight ahead, almost everything is divergent and you have to regularize the system somehow, manipulate it a little bit such that uh, you, you're dealing with finite terms and if everything goes fine at the end, you can remove the regularization and you get a finite, the final result, finite results. Mm -hmm. So this, um, this was done before, but for non-abelian gauge theories, so when, you, when it depends on the order of the generators, it didn't work before, and then he, he found this method, which actually works there as well, and this caused actually the revolution into the, the standard model of quantum physics established. But their article, which they wrote in 71, was rejected by the Dutch Elsevier editorial. And he said, well, the, 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 the referee commented that we we, we, didn't, we we do not know that the space dimension is poor. <laughs> A little bit later, then Toft Weltman came out with the same idea. They claimed they haven't noted, they didn't know about this preprint, although from the Archie said, well, it was lying around as a preprint at the certain shelf desk in the library and so on. Um, okay, we cannot prove it, but uh, at least we know that Weltmann was in this editorial board of the six letters B. So, so, okay, they elaborated it much more. It became a, a large story. They even got a Nobel Prize for that. And uh, seldomly is uh, uh, Polini, uh, John Biarchi are quoted, but uh, so this was. Uh, so uh, okay, it was still it was a pleasure uh, to know him, and he he knew in particular about distribution theory, so which was uh, uh, it's a kind of generalization of the functions. So the book by uh, Gelfan Chilov, uh, two Russians who wrote a textbook about this, he he considered his Bible. He knew all the you know all the formula mm -hmm. by by heart and so on. And this is how how he got into this idea of analytic continuation with dimensional regularization. So that was, I think this was ninety four to ninety six. 
And mm -hmm. there were plenty of famous people, some, mm -hmm. of, them, some of them quite elderly, I have, say, have to say, but still it was a pleasure to meet people like uh, Jeffrey Goldstone, you know, them from the Nambu Goldstone bosons, mm -hmm. Roman Chakif, very famous mm -hmm. from Anomalies, Francis Law, for instance, I uh, once had coffee and then he told me uh, he is famous for the Jew Law theory of mesonuclear scattering. And he, mm -hmm. said, he told me, okay, he's, he collaborated with two first by correspondence. They didn't know each other. And then when they collaborated a bit more, they, they got to meet. And the funny thing is that he thought that Chu was probably Chinese because of his name. And uh, Chu <laughs> thought that Law was Chinese because of his name. But when they met, they noticed that none of them was really Chinese. <laughs> uh, well, Victor Weisskopf, I think I saw him a couple of times. His office was still there, but he was already, unfortunately, in a bad health. And um, mm. OK, so uh, but he was, of course, a legend of physics. OK, I remember once there was a workshop which was uh, supposed to bring physics and philosophy together. Mm -hmm. so they had apparently a group of resources. They invited really famous people, also famous physicists like uh, Glashow, Weinberg and so on. They usually just came to give their talk and disappeared again. But uh, but unfortunately, mm -hmm. the, the, the idea to really have physicists and philosophers, philosophers discussing and finding a common language, I think it has completely failed. Mm -hmm. Everybody thinks in his own way. I remember when Glashow gave his talk, then the philosopher, a lady philosopher, asked him, what does the existence of symmetries in nature really mean <laughs> from a philosophical perspective? And he had no idea what to say about this. I said, well, I don't know. And they said, ah, oh, now I know. And then he started about quantum unification and SU5 and so on. Blah, blah, blah. And, <laughs> and yeah, Weinberg, his, his field theory book was relatively new, so his talk was consisted essentially of drawing the title page of his field theory book and says, you know, everything you want to know about physics and about the world, you have to read in this book. <laughs> then I remember Price David, uh, okay, he asked this, uh, some some string theorists were very enthusiastic and then he just asked him, but why does it take so long? You announced that you can, uh, you can revolutionize physics already 20 years ago and now you still don't have the breakthrough and okay, this is still true today. I think David does not live anymore, but now it's another almost uh, yeah, more than 20 years uh, almost 30 years ago and still don't have the great break to that <laughs> can't really predict uh, anything observable and so, so when i arrived this was still called kfa Kern kernforschungsanlage so it was still called the institute for nuclear investigation and then they, they noticed first it is not correct anymore because they, they worked in many other things even mm -hmm. biology and so on and second the name is not so well received anymore okay nuclear sounds first nuclear weapons weapons are highly destructive and even nuclear plants are uh, uh, had, a, had a bad reputation already so on then so, so, so the better changing the name and call it research center Jülich. Jülich is a small town somewhere in germany not far from belgium and the netherlands and luxembourg and so on so it's uh, once I was sent to a workshop in Copenhagen, I think it was the same time, the first time that I went so far to the north. And I, <laughs> I remember one anecdote, okay, it was a workshop and there was a, a very famous physicist, I better don't say his name now, but <clears throat> he was the chairman of a talk. And then when the speaker uh, spoke for a while, he told him five minutes to end. But then somebody consulted the program and says, well, according to the program, he still has 10 minutes. Said, yeah, yeah, but he, he started five minutes later. But then he still has 15 minutes. Okay, but um, yeah, okay, let's just go on. Just go on. The Nordish Institute of Theoretical Physics, uh, which at that time was still in Copenhagen. I think now it has moved to Sweden. So it was in the same building as the Niels Bohr Institute. And uh, Holger Beck Nielsen was there, and I heard about him before. There are stories about him uh, in the physics community and so on. But uh, uh, he is really famous. He did very, very important works in different fields. And uh, then I noticed that he is a real media star in Denmark. So you have, to have a beer in a bar somewhere, and people ask you, what are you doing? Yeah, something with physics. Oh, do you know Holger Beck Nielsen? But he was, he is, although he is very famous, he is always very friendly, ready to discuss anything you want to discuss, and very patient and so on. And uh, 
I remember once he he arrived by the same, you know, with a suit very formal, and then uh, people puzzled a bit. Why don't you dress like that, Holger? And they said, well, in the afternoon, I'm invited to to have a whatever cocktail with the palace of the Queen Margaret. Oh, Sometimes okay. I heard him also giving interviews in, in the telephone. So he was chatting into the telephone so the whole building could hear him about what is what is the possible role of God in the Big Bang and things like that. <laughs> he had a bit his own ideas, which were a bit of the mainstream of the physics community. So, okay, so usually you think when you lower energies, then uh, mm -hmm. symmetries symmetries can break. Yeah? And then uh, he had the, the opposite idea that at very high energy, everything was sym symmetric in the big bang, and then there was lowering energy, then messed up things. And okay, he, he kind of inverted, uh, inverted things and uh, Okay, it's, it's okay if I, he has a small community working with him, but uh, for it was then a bit, he was then a little bit of the mainstream of, of the, the general, generally accepted ideas. Yeah. Uh, was in charge of taking care of all these exercises of mechanics and electrodynamics and so on. And uh, this was, this is uh, not very exciting, extremely time consuming, but okay, well, somebody has to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, then I, I pushed a lot to be able to be allowed to give also lectures. I did this sometimes in Berlin and sometimes also in Potsdam. Okay, usually it's nice to deal with students, physics students. They are motivated because, okay, they study this because they, they like it. Once I was then assigned to do a lecture of other students who study biology or something and just have physics as a compulsory course, uh, which they often didn't really like. And then I had uh, this experience that they were completely unmotivated. And uh, although I tried to make it interesting for them, they, they really didn't, <laughs> they showed no interest. So that was a bit of frustrating experience. Yeah, okay. but... Once I was also in charge of a competition, a German-wide competition for school kids, where they did some experiments for physics, these uh, physics experiments, uh, uh, like building a own rocket with certain, with only with pressure of water, with certain constraints, and then see how how high how high you get and so on. And uh, this was really was very uh, extremely nice experience. Okay, usually we say that particle physics has a bit of a stagnation since the 1970s when it had a very rapid evolution. At, at least in this specific area of theoretical physics, I, I was then fortunate to follow and being somewhat involved in a small revolution of uh, something which was before considered impossible to uh, put fermions and the lattice is a discrete space time or a grid and uh, which serves as a regularization in quantum field theory because then you cut off the very short distances or the very high momenta. And mm -hmm. then uh, people often thought that you cannot, uh, you have a certain problem when you put fermions one type of particles on this lattice because they kind of double. And if you want to avoid that, you break uh, symmetry, which they have in nature, archival symmetry. And um, then uh, it suddenly turned out you can actually put it on the lattice at least for vector type theories with uh, re respecting this chiral symmetry in a modified form, which then smoothly turns into the continuum form in the continuum limit. So that's uh, this was a kind of a revolution that I was very lucky that I worked exactly on this field before, and then I could experience and contribute a little bit uh, to, to this uh, rapid evolution, to this kind of revolution that we have. This is what I wrote this habilitation thesis mm -hmm. about also. The condi one condition is that you have to give a talk about some uh, subject that uh, you agree on only two weeks in advance, which is not your field of, of work. And then if the, uh, people want to see if you are able within two weeks to prepare a decent talk about something new. And mm -hmm. then I got into the field of cosmic rays and law, uh, Lawrence invariance violation. So this um, I wrote, wrote uh, an extensive review article about it because I started to like the field and explore it more. So, uh, the question was uh, still open at the time if ultra high energy cosmic rays um, if they respect a certain cutoff for the energy, which uh, they should have according to Lorentz invariance. At, at that time, it was uncertain for more for time. It even seemed that it breaks it. And so I got very excited about that. And they have tremendous energies, which uh, oscillators cannot attain. 
and so I said, okay, maybe we, we, we see here new physics. And well, later it turned out that actually with more careful observations as usual, mm -hmm. standard physics was confirmed and the new physics is not confirmed. And okay, so so okay, mm -hmm. searching new physics is a bit of frustrating business, but I still I found it very interesting to, to, uh, to explore the literature about it. And sometimes some, some way more interesting than working out a project yourself where you elaborate a lot of details, but then I didn't have to do that. I just read a lot of literature and uh, wrote a huge review about this and, uh, uh, and uh, okay, we produced some things, but uh, but I didn't have to, to go to the, the original data, which is very tedious, so I kind of enjoyed that. <laughs> I remember one visit, we had Lev Okun, very mm -hmm. famous Russian physicist, uh, so he was a student or his advisor was uh, Sakharov, and he told us, uh, us a bit about his experience that uh, they also had these worries that uh, uh, maybe a very high energy experiment could, could push us into from a false vacuum into something which which is harmful and so on. And uh, so that Sakharov just told him, oh, come on, this kind of research should be forbidden what you're doing. So, mm -hmm. so, so, so I went to conferences, so for instance, in Morocco, Morocco Marrakesh, I met mm -hmm. Coin, Coin Danucci, very nice guy. Uh, mm -hmm. He tried to convince us that um, the objection that Einstein and others had against quantum mechanics are kind of uh, somehow overcome by a thanks to quantum field theory. And then I asked him, but um, you can understand quantum field theory in some sense as a, uh, or, as a, or quantum mechanics as a one-dimensional field theory where you just have time and then the spatial coordinates are the fields. So, so conceptually, it is not that different. How can it overcome the problem? He said, oh, this is a very interesting question. Started to talk a lot, but unfortunately, didn't answer the question. But after 9-11, <laughs> uh, they couldn't go to the US anymore, but uh, most of them did their PhD. So they said, OK, now we organize a known conference in Iran uh, one interesting point is that it's the only country in the world where I was told there are more female, more girls, girls studying physics than, than, than boys. Yeah, after that, I moved to Mexico, um, Mexico City, where they have this huge university, the south of Mexico City. So they officially they have more than 300,000 students. Actually, it includes a high school. So if you don't um, count the school kids, it's maybe 200,000 200, and something students, but still huge. Maybe uh, I'm not mm -hmm. sure if there's a larger university in terms of student numbers in the world, you know, maybe in China. Still, uh, we have separation of uh, between institutes and faculties here, but uh, faculties do most of the teaching on to, up to the, the bachelor. And institutes, usually you don't do that. You teach uh, at the master level or at the, and, and then you have also more time for just for your research, for your own activities, which is very nice, which I appreciated a lot. And it sends better working conditions than in Germany. Of course, the disadvantage is that my field of this uh, lattice field theory, which is which was very, uh, Berlin was a, was a stronghold of that. So maybe the, the best center of, of activity of that now in Mexico, this was unknown. Uh, all over Latin America, there was also only a small group in, in Brazil, two mm -hmm. persons essentially doing that in Sao Paulo. And then I ever since I'm trying to build my own group in Mexico. Um, of course, there's a lot of bureaucracy. So uh, actually, this, the, I underestimated this in the beginning, but uh, just bureaucratic duties can be very tedious and, and time consuming. But OK, you also get used to that. Um, mm -hmm. Once I got a very funny phone call from Germany, somebody who referred to this review artic article about cosmic rays. And then, mm -hmm. then only after talking him for, to a, for, for uh, talking to him for a while, I, I understood what uh, what really made him call that he was part of this crazy uh, uh, group who tried to to go to court against the LHC because they claimed oh. the LHC will destroy the universe. And then at oh. the, uh, the beginning, he didn't tell me that, but after talking to him, that then I, I understood that he belongs to this group and he wanted to see if he can get anything out of my article supporting his, his point of view that he was <laughs> several times in Brazil, quite a number. So at, at some period, okay, this was before Bolsonaro, science was very well funded and they organized a lot of conferences and invited me a number of times. And there was once in this place, Foster y Guauzu, which is which has a huge waterfall, one of the greatest, uh, largest in the world, uh, next to Paraguay and Argentina. 
they organized also a huge event with very prominent speakers and the, <clears throat> the, the plenary sessions were also in a, in a very large lecture hall. And as you know, usually the senior professors tend to sit in the front rows and the students, they, they prefer to stay a little bit behind. And um, one speaker, I remember, he, I think he was talking about cosmology and he said, well, first of all, when you look in your telescope in far distances, you also look in the past, of course, because it takes the light some, some time to travel here. And mm -hmm. actually, this is also true in this lecture hall. People there behind look really younger than the people here in front. <laughs> and so, and <laughs> Alan Espect was there, for instance, this work before he got his Nobel Prize, but he explained his famous experiment uh, uh, showing that the Bell inequalities are violated. And there mm -hmm. was a nice talk by somebody I didn't know before. He has a Nobel Prize winner, Douglas Osharev, Osharov. Mm -hmm. um, he told us about, a bit about his biography. He was studying, uh, he did working on his PhD if low temperature or observing liquid helium and so on. The, all, every one of the students has built his own uh, uh, machine to have very low temperature. At some point, he, he broke it by some incident and had to restart again. And then he mm -hmm. was already in his sixth years of PhD and didn't really have results. It was un, uncertain if he could actually finish his PhD and so on. He was already nervous and frustrated. And then once in the evening, he was in the laboratory, he started to see something which looked interesting. And then he stayed all night and kept uh, kept uh, moving this experiment. And then early in the morning, he was convinced that he had found a new phase transition. And he, he called his advisor. He woke him up early in the morning over the phone and said, well, you can do that, but you should be sure that he has something <laughs> interesting to say. And, and then, okay, it, it turned out it is indeed a new phase transition that wasn't known before. And, and then he was, a, was an excellent thesis in the long term. He got his Nobel Prize for, for this discovery. And so it was, uh, let's say, in one night, a jump from practically zero to infinite. Yes. Okay, it refers to elementary particles, to particle physics. Okay, the theoretical background is quantum field theory, kind of the extension of quantum mechanics. If you bring it together with special relativity, general mm -hmm. relativity, we still don't have included so far, unfortunately. But uh, it's, if you bring it together with special relativity, you have this field theory. So the fields are just there everywhere in the universe all the time. Um, the space is never empty in this sense, but they can have different states. If they are in their ground state, then you say, okay, this is a, we, we perceive this as a vacuum. And if they have excite, excitations, then these are the particles. And um, so this is the formalism, how, how we describe, of course, then the excitations can move and so on, they can interact. And so this is how we describe the world, how we describe elementary particles as the smallest, uh, the, the most elementary building blocks of, of all matter that we are aware of. And um, okay, um, again, you have to find a way how to calculate uh, in this field, in quantum field theory, because things seem divergent and then, what we do, okay, there are different approaches is that we discretize space time. So instead of a continuous space time, we have a grid or we call it a lattice. And this regularizes the theory. It's a very clean regularization because you know what you're doing on the regularized level. Dimensional regularization is not, this is not so clear. And uh, you respect the really crucial symmetries, the gauge symmetries by, by construction that is, that, is, um, that is all well done. And you can also turn it into a kind of a statistical system, uh, which is then convenient for computer simulations. So you have Monte Carlo simulations for things that you cannot really calculate. And then you're not limited to the perturbation theory. Perturbation theory is, means that you start from free particles and then you can calculate, you can include uh, a little bit of interaction, so it's more order by order as if it was infinitesimal. But um, this is actually a strong limitation. It works very, not very well in quantum electrodynamics, but when you're confronted with strong interactions, such as in former uh, quantum chromodynamics at low energy, then this uh, fails completely, but you can still do this Monte Carlo simulations, then you, don't, you do not depend on this expansion. You have, of course, statistical errors, systematical errors, and so on, like the experimentalists, but you can compute in principle without depending on this perturbative expansion. And uh, so I started to get to like this a lot. So this is my main field of interest, of, of research. We have uh, these lattice conferences. 
Um, once we had one of the founders of the field, Mike Reutz, he worked in Brookhaven, he has retired now, we uh, convinced him to come to Mexico to, get, to, work, to speak in our workshop and give a kind of a review talk about uh, that this field theory, which is not so known here. I remember one nice citation that he made in the beginning said, be discreet, do it on the lattice. Yes. <laughs> Sometimes there were also quite polemic, uh, there was quite polemic interruptions and so on. There was in particular one person who was famous for this uh, polemic, but now they have established a code of ethics that you have to sign. So now you should already <laughs> committed to be polite to other participants. So <laughs> say when I was in, still in high school, I just escaped, let's say, the, the period of these punch cards. I heard about this, but I was not really, and I saw some of them, but I was not really confronted with this. My elder brother, I think they still made him work with this, which is very tedious. And then, okay, we already had very simple computers where you could program in basic, which I learned enthusiastically. Later, mm -hmm. I was in Zurich, I learned Pascal, uh, which was, okay, well invented by a local um, computer scientist, Niklas Wirth, and, and uh, I was convinced that this was the dominant language. And later at CERN, I noticed that out of Zurich, it is not really used so much. <laughs> but <laughs> then I, okay, then, then they made me learn Fortran in particular. Um, okay, then, okay, actually this Pascal is very close to C. And mm -hmm. then I saw, okay, C++ is actually in some sense nicer, but it's not so easily accessible. So actually at the end, I, I still prefer Fortran. And, the, and we once made in when we were in Berlin a large scale test if there is any uh, if there is actually a difference in computing time, and because we, before we thought maybe C plus plus is much more efficient, but it turned out that no once it's once you have your executable actually for what we are doing it's quite equivalent. So okay, also Fortran is still still mm. in business. Okay, now of course a lot of students come and you know this more. <laughs> this mm. language is like Python or Julia. And tell mm. them, well, okay, this is nice for certain things. It does a lot of things automatically, but first it is not pedagogical because you don't program. Okay, you only program with uh, part kind of yourself, but lot you dedicate a lot to routines which are prepared. But mm. secondly, it is highly inefficient. If you want to do a long simulation, which takes days or weeks, then it loses up to a factor of 100 in speed. And I cannot afford that. So I still force my students to learn one traditional language of their choice. They can choose whatever they like, but they cannot do it with, with Python. Okay. Or... Meanwhile, I've written about 160 articles including mm. proceeding contributions, uh, been cited about 3,000, a bit more than 3,000 times. I'm also frequent referees. I have counted this uh, in 34 different journals and also some 10 founding agencies. Um, I was advisor. It's always nice to be advisor of thesis. Uh, five PhDs, uh, seven masters, and about eight bachelor. Um, Mm -hmm. um, then we have here in Mexico a kind of an internship, they call it a social service, although it's not such so, not very social nor a service, but uh, they have to do this for half a year, and this is how usually I recruit new students, so make them do some Monte Carlo simulations and learn, relearn quantum mechanics in this way from a different perspective. I got to the lattice actually to... Uh, um, a colleague that was named Uwe Jens Wiese, uh, who I shared for a short time with Office Miss, uh, when I was still doing my PhD in Bern. He was already at more at once. And he, he told me about this. And then I started to collaborate with him at a distance. He also invited me to MIT and so on. And now, re now we have recently finished a textbook about quantum field theory and particle physics that, um, okay, we. I think he started to work with lecture notes about it already more than 20 years ago. And then about uh, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. 15 years ago, I uh, he, he involved me, said, OK, we can do this together. And then I also used his notes and, and we elaborated this more and more again. And uh, But it is kind of discontinuous, because if you have a half written paper, you see, OK, if you work on it a month, then you have it done. But, uh, if this book, okay, sometimes we worked on it intensively, in particular when I visited Switzerland, but this was for, for one, two months, and then the the end is still far away. You cannot see the horizon. Then you start to work again, and this went on and on for more than 10 years. And 
during the pandemics, we uh, intensified also when I was for sabbatical in Bern, we intensified the work on it. And now we have this finally done. It has uh, 772 pages, but uh, mm -hmm. it is not a popular book. It is more from, uh, let's say, postgraduate uh, on. But um, okay, we are very, it's a great relief that this is finally done. And it will, it's supposed to, to appear. In, uh, January or February in uh, Cambridge University Press. And yes. This is something that I started doing only when I arrived in Mexico. So, okay, I, I tried this also. For instance, I told you this article about the history of dimensional regularization. This is mm -hmm. in Physics Today. Actually, it was, uh, was very nice communicating them. They asked, like, if you an editor as a communication person, which, we communica which I communicated a lot with to, to have this straight. And then um, about cosmic rays, I mentioned, I wrote about the Higgs particle when, when the discovery was new. I wrote a popular science article about it and uh, also topological phase transitions, uh, more abstract subjects. But when it got a Nobel Prize, that was also a good moment to write about it and uh, just elementary particles in general, essentially what I told you, how they are described by quantum fields. Okay, also neutrinos in particular, I wrote once also when it was a Nobel Prize year of, for neutrino oscillation, then I wrote a popular science article about it. We have a popular science group in our institute. I wanted to have an interview about this Oppenheimer movie. Actually, I have a lot of points to criticize, but nevertheless, I recommend, uh, recommend it, and I still recommend watching the movie. Yeah. And then also beyond physics, more mathematics. I, I It was very, um, I found it very exciting, although I'm sort of not the first one to review the history of the cubic equation. Mm -hmm. It's very really strange. I was never taught. I learned this myself. One could teach this in high school. Um, at least the smart students would understand this, but it is not done. And in university, neither they, they jump over it. They, they, they don't give it importance anymore, although it was once considered really the formula of the millennium, <laughs> which mm -hmm. people are about. And then there was a heavy dispute in, in Italy who are about the priority. And uh, I consider him the greatest mathematician of all time. And I can give, okay, of course, it's a matter of point of view, but I can give statistical arguments there is this page, uh, Wolfram Matworld, where he could search how many terms are named after Euler, and I found more than 70. So mm. Euler number, Euler constant, Euler line, Euler triangle, Euler angle, and so on. So more than 70 terms, and uh, he is clearly number one. Then number two would be Gauss with about 40 terms, and so on. So, so he has a criterion to say, okay, it's not just my my taste. So I feel you trust this. So I, I, and he is... His work is very presentable in the things in the sense that he can present many things just with a with a few lines that the, the crucial ideas. And later, okay, this was 18th century. Later in the 19th century, mathematics got much more complicated and much more uh, abstract. So then you got not more mm -hmm. not that uh, convenient for <laughs> popular yeah. presentation anymore. And uh, uh, so so it was in the perfect period. And uh, so of course, I uh, kind of feel. That I okay, I did the same hometown and even grew up in the same suburb of Basel as myself. Oh, recently, <laughs> during the pandemics, I wrote something about Ramanujan. Okay, mathematics history is, has many genius, but he is unique in the sense that he was a pure autodidact. Uh, that nobody, he didn't have any studies, he just had a, a book uh, uh, from the library, which was actually for repeating. Uh, things that you have learned already, maybe for students who prepare exams and so on, just full of formula with a few hints how it is derived. By no means meant that you could study mathematics with that, but this is the only book that he had. And then he 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 managed to derive all that or to understand all that. And then he uh, derived his own formula as an incredible genius. And uh, unfortunately, mm -hmm. he died young and so on. But, uh, but then I, I could link somehow his, his way of doing summation to quantum field theory and to the concept of randomization. Article about Alexander Grotendieck, <clears throat> who some people call the greatest mathematician of the 20th century. He had mm -hmm. a very adventurous life, or very up a great genius, but uh, okay, then also he turned into an activist or against nuclear weapons, against pollution and so on. Then he got frustrated because he didn't have the impact that he expected. And uh, 
the end, when I heard about him, actually, I didn't even know if he was uh, still alive or not. Nobody knew because he retired in some small village in the Pyrenees and didn't have a postal address or anything. And mm. then devoted himself more to meditation. And uh, I know some, for instance, a group of Japanese mathematicians badly wanted to talk to him and they searched for him in the Pyrenees, but they couldn't find him. That they, <laughs> they returned yeah. about. And then at some point it was then... Um, appeared in the media that he has uh, he has died and then I thought now is the right moment to to explore a little bit about his life. I wrote yeah. something about the Maya numerals numerals. So okay, yeah, then yeah. I compared different uh, numeral systems, positional numeral systems, and uh, and then my point of departure was um, actually Pascal, a French mathematician. He once claimed that actually the decimals that we are using are not so good. He recommended a dual decimal system with the basis of of 12 and then you say okay you know, we, sp we speak about dozens so this is still there and then mm -hmm. um, then lay actually at some point i think the french uh, considered changing all the unit system according to him so that it is not decimal but dual decimal anymore but uh, lagrange discouraged them and says okay i, I don't see really any an advantage with that and then i thought well now okay i can consider different sy number systems also big decimal and then the maya long count numbers and then I, I have to find that criterion, how to compare which one is good, which one is better than the other. Of course, it's a kind of a joke. You can invent criterion. I just said, if you have a really huge number, let's say with 100 digits and whatever system, or, then um, you want to know quickly if it's divisible by a small number. So if you have the decimal, you can see from the large digits if it's divisible by two, by, uh, by five or by 10. And if you have the last two digits, you see if it's divisible by four. But if you want to know if it's divisible by three, okay, you can take the sum of all the digits or by nine also. Okay, that's what you learn in primary school. But then if you want to know if it's divisible by seven or 13, then you already have a hard time. And uh, then I wonder now, how is this if you write numbers in, in other systems? And then I compare kind of the quality, how, 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 how easily you can find out if it's divisible. And then I noticed among the systems that I compared the Maya long count number, numeral system is actually the best. So, so I recommended that one should drop the decimals and revitalize the system. But of course, nobody is going to listen to me. Mm. <laughs> to my yeah. surprise, there are now several articles who, who take up the idea and, and so on. And <laughs> so always, okay, I have my speciality, my special field of work, but I'm also was happy to do also completely different things once in a while. That, that's, that, that, that's the idea of science, not to get locked in in something too specific. I, I know colleagues who do that. They have one very specific thing that move, don't move out of this little corner anymore. And so I think that's not the idea of science from my point of view. But uh, it's a language more in terms of formula and the kinds of way of thinking. So even if you speak about other things, about art or literature or so on, you have a kind of uh, a communication level that is uh, somehow you have a similar way of thinking. So I, I enjoy this a lot. And um, OK, I was, for instance, at one occasion in Benasque. This is also in the Spanish mountains uh, in the Pyrenees. And um, OK, I have own collaborators in many countries. I just counted mm -hmm. about 21. They actually do this. Physics is a kind of, a, although we work in distinct collaborations, sometimes in, in competition with each other, but all together, it's a common project of all of us, of humanity, to resolve, to, to understand the secrets of nature. And in this sense, we work together as a community. And it even builds bridges between ethical groups, between countries, and so on. And that's why, again, I said, actually, it's a kind of a model for, for the rest of humanity. If, if all the humanity would collaborate as well as we did, then we would have no wars and no, <laughs> and people could solve a lot of a lot, lot of problems in the world. So that's why I still see, uh, all in all, despite certain polemics and so on, as all in all, I still see the physics community as a good example of how communication collaboration should work among us humans <laughs> it's been recorded yeah recorded. Well,